Good morning from Bangkok. Not to start this vlog on a downer, but we had probably one of the worst nights sleep ever. And our hostel wasn't what we expected. We genuinely didn't think it was the right place when we turned up last night. There are some general things that are nice to see in a hostel. For example, a locker that can just fit a standard size carry-on. This one only has lockers that can fit a small backpack or a purse. It's also really nice when you have your own electronic socket and light at your bed. This one only has an overhead light for the entire room and it has one power bar that everyone in the whole entire room is meant to share in the middle of the room. There's also no toilet paper seemingly around and breakfast is only between 9 and 10 a.m. Well guess what it is 8 a.m. and we have a tour to be at for 9 o'clock so we've missed out. Yep. Uh, the fact that the mattresses are paper thin they are on yoga mats so it basically feels like you are either sleeping in a tent or on concrete or both. The pillows are not the best, the blankets don't even cover your full body or at least they definitely don't cover mine and to top it all off then unfortunately we're sharing with at least a couple of people who just don't seem to understand hostel etiquette whatsoever and seem to turn the lights on and off whenever they want to. And just to add to that what contributed to me having a bad sleep in addition to the very uncomfortable mattress mm. was the fact that every time you move your body an inch and I'm not exaggerating when I say that the bed creaks so loudly and that was not just my bed it was every single bed in our six bed dorm not a great start we do feel like we're misled because certainly the reviews and the pictures looked so good and made it look like it was a brilliant place to come but yeah this place was rated an eight which is pretty decent and it had a thousand reviews so i don't know what all these other people experienced Probably the first time in the history I think we're going to recommend, we're recommending do not come here. So, Skylark Bangkok, avoid like the plague, it's not worth it. But anyway, we carry on, we have a walking tour to get to, so we are going to walk there, hopefully via somewhere where we can get some breakfast and coffee. So let's crack on. We're very excited to go on a walking tour and learn more about the history of this city and see it because we're actually very excited to be here in Bangkok. And especially Thailand, we've had so many good things. So let's leave behind the rough start and really enjoy today. just finished our walking tour and it was just shy of two hours. It wasn't my favorite walking tour that we've done. Our guide was very friendly, but I just found it very chaotic and I thought that the information was presented in a pretty convoluted way and I actually didn't think we were even given that much information that you couldn't already have found online yourself. 
we definitely had better ones during our travels. If there was a positive to take from it though, it certainly did get to see some really cool stuff. We got kind of a bit of a feel for what Bangkok's all about, which is really nice. It's a little bit of a shame that we can get more of a sense of history, but I guess like because Bangkok is quite a young city, there's not a massive amount of history to delve into, which I guess is why maybe we didn't get as much information as we have when we visit other places. Yeah, I mean, as he said, this isn't an ancient city. It was founded in 1782, so it's probably a pretty good reason why there is not a huge amount of history here. But I think the good thing was we got a bit more of a sense of Thai culture, we got a feel for the city and what it's all about, and yeah, it's just a nice way to get us out of the hostel, so can't complain too much. And he gave us some tips on how to get across the river, where to catch the ferry, also some information on the types of markets we should be looking out for. Guidelines on pricing and things like that. So yeah, I think um, we definitely still got some information that will be useful to us as we go through Bangkok and the rest of Thailand, but it just wasn't quite in the usual style of walking tour, I guess, that we used it. But we move on to our next place. We have just arrived to the Grand Palace and we have purchased tickets. They are 500 baht each, which is about 20 Canadian dollars each. So here we are at the Grand Palace, but before we crack on and go and explore this properly, then we wanted to give you a little bit of a history lesson about Thailand based on what we've learned so far. So Bangkok, as mentioned, wasn't the capital of Thailand, also known as Siam up until 1782. Before that, the capital was located just across the Chao Phraya River over in a place called Tomburi. Tomburi, incidentally, is now part of the metropolis that is Bangkok, but it was a separate city once upon a time. That was the capital until it was then moved to Bangkok in 1782 by King Rama I. That then began a <laughs> dynasty of kings that remained in power until Thailand became a constitutional monarchy in 1932. Up until that point, it was an absolute monarchy. This palace wasn't constructed all at once. Over those hundreds of years, buildings have been erected over time. We're about to go into what is considered the most important building in the Grand Palace. It is called the Chapel of the Emerald Buddha. It has had a bit of a journeyman type history. Apparently it was discovered about 300 years prior to the construction of this palace and it's been around parts of Thailand, and Laos and various other parts before then being brought to Tomburi and eventually Bangkok. 
in time for the construction of this palace. So with that, the chapel itself was part of the initial construction of this palace in 1782. So when this was built back in 1782, the building on my right was the king's residence and that included everything. Bed chambers, public audience halls, private audience halls, changing rooms, all of that kind of thing. That all occurred until King Rama V's reign and then in 1877 with the help of a British architect then they moved everything to this building. As you can see, it's got a beautiful blend of Western and Thai architecture rolled in. And that was the seat of the king's residence up until the advent of a constitutional monarchy in 1932, when everything moved away from this palace site entirely. The site nowadays is purely used for ceremonial purposes and state visits. know that it was expensive in relative terms to get into the Grand Palace, but I think that it was 100% worth it. I haven't seen a palace that looks like this anywhere else in the world, so I found this architectural and design style very unique and new to me. Maybe by the time we're out of this part of the world, I'll be like, oh, just another palace. But right now, this one being the first that I've seen that's decorated like this, it is just so beautiful. Like they seem to use these mosaic glass tiles that are all very colorful because I mean, there's like reds and blues and greens and it's all like intertwined between the gold and it's just so striking. It truly is. I don't think I've ever been to any kind of royal residence where it has been this outwardly vibrant. I certainly with the kind of western palaces that we're used to then a lot of the decorations kept very much inside. Mm. This really reminds me more of like a temple in terms of the amount of colour that it gives off. And really its beauty is not just in the colour, but it's also just in the intricacy and the detail. Like every single Part of a leaf is accounted for, every single petal of flower is very carefully marked and noted just purely because of that and it just makes it all the more impressive because like don't get me wrong it must have taken quite some time to actually be created in the first place but using what we would consider to be quite archaic tools that have been probably lost to time now to be able to create this kind of art and sculpture it's it's amazing to think about yeah just to add to what you said there are such detailed carvings of elephants mm -hmm. monkeys birds flowers just the pattern that the mosaics make it really is absolutely stunning and it can feel a little bit overwhelming to walk around because there's just so much to these grounds but I think it's interesting because obviously what we stepped into at first was like the spiritual part which was dedicated to Buddhism practices and things like that but then when you actually come more out into the royal residences then it's a much more I want to say contemporary style of palace where it's a lot more sprawling the grounds are much larger and you've got manicured lawns, perfectly kept Tiberian bonsai trees and 
that kind of serenity after what you could probably only say is a bit of a rush of the inside of the complex around the Chapel of the Emerald Buddha. It is just really nice and it kind of leaves you with like that Zen feeling as you make your way out the grounds. I think that is going to be us by way of our sightseeing so far, but we are definitely joining up for some food and some coffee, so let's go find some of that. We ended up picking up some lunch from 7-Eleven on the way back from the Grand Palace because we had all the good intentions to go to Khao San Road tonight and try some delicious Thai food. But Nick has a major migraine, so that has definitely put a damper on our plans. However, we still have at least another day here in Bangkok, so we will pick this up tomorrow. In the meantime, take care and keep smiling. Thank you.